In the Gun, episode 94, it is Phil Steele Friday. I'm Skylar Callahan, and that's Jed Drenning. We're going to get to Phil here in just a bit, right after the break. But as we always do, we're going to revisit our picks from last week. If you if you haven't tuned into these episodes just yet, and you're getting kind of familiar with these Phil Steele episodes on Friday, what Jed and I do is we, we kind of make our own little handicaps here with the West Virginia game. We come back, we revisit them, we talk to Phil, and then we make our new picks for the week. So, Jed, let us know how bad we both did, or probably more so how bad I did last week. All right, let's start with this. Uh, we made three picks, West Virginia, Texas Tech. We Because we knew going into the game what a critical uh, part of winning a fast start would have to be because Tech had ambushed us four straight years. Yeah. We said, okay, who will be winning after the first quarter? Will West Virginia be winning after the first quarter, yes or no? Uh, you said no. I said yes. It was 7-3 to three Mountaineers after the first quarter. So more so than the 7-3 to three lead, we avoided the 10 or 14-point deficit right. that we dug ourselves into so many times against these guys. So that was the first one. The second one, one of the storylines last week, was a year ago, Texas Tech tried more fourth downs than anybody in the free world, uh, like all the way back to 2008 in the CFBstats.com database. Nobody had tried more fourth downs. But through three games, they were kind of off script. They weren't doing that this year. They'd only attempted six. So we said, will they return to form against West Virginia and attempt a bunch of fourth downs? So we gave the over-under at four and a half. Will Texas Tech go over four and a half fourth down attempts you picked under i picked under they attempted eight they went five for eight so we both missed on that one <clears throat> and then finally wvu and this was tough to handicap we we uh wanted to talk about the uh, wvu ground game and we said we're on 142 and a half uh, over under for west virginia rushing yards because texas tech was allowing 143 yards now we knew that would be critical because West Virginia had struggled in all four of those straight losses to Texas Tech to run the football. Even when we were feeling good about our run game, it didn't work out against Texas Tech. Well, it worked out well enough on Saturday. The over-under was 142.5. We ran for 157. You picked under. I picked over. So that's how our three picks shook out last week. I need a bounce back week in the worst right. ways. My, we got some fun ones after Phil. We got some fun ones. Yes, we do. And and uh, quickly here, also uh, this episode of ITG is brought to you by uh, Bet Online and also our friends at Toothman Ford. We all know cars cost less in Grafton, so a lot of interesting games kind of on the slate this week. There's, I, I should say that kind of with a grain of salt because there's not a ton of great games this weekend on the slate, but there's there there are a handful that we're going to dive into here with Phil in just a moment. But uh, it's a very light Big 12 schedule to a certain extent. There's only six games. I guess that's probably about par for the course just now that we're in conference play. Well, it's um, getting to where they're all meaningful. Yeah. Right? I mean, the plots are starting to thicken. These conference matchups, now you're starting to get a sense of who is what, 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 what each team's role is going to be. So the more that happens with, with interleague play uh, – uh, the more fascinating it could get. I mean, all these things are pretty interesting yeah. within the conference. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just got kind of used to 14 different Big 12 games every yeah. week. Yeah. So now, now there's only six or seven, which it kind of makes it a little, a little easier here for us so we can actually dive into these things. But uh, so anyways, we're, we're not going to keep you waiting too much longer, but uh, we will take a quick break right, right now. And then when we come back, we will be joined by Phil Steele, to get into some of the best matchups in the Big 12, top 25, and then, of course, get Phil's pick on West Virginia. And by the way, Jed, I went back and checked. Phil is four for four on his West Virginia predictions here on this show. So let's see if he's going to go with the Mountaineers on the road this week. Let's see. I have a feeling he might. I have a feeling he might, but we'll see. So, anyways, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with Phil Steele on the other side. You are in the gut.
Nobody supports the Blue and Gold Mountaineers like Toothman Ford. With over 20 NIL deals and counting, Toothman Ford continues to rally behind our student athletes. And it's time we rally and support the dealer that supports the Mountaineers. Not only does Toothman Ford offer the best prices in the state on pre-owned, their never over MSRP campaign on new Fords guarantee to, to save you thousands. thousands. Drive with pride all season long, knowing you're supporting the dealer that fuels our Mountaineers. Toothman Ford, where cars cost less. In Grafton and at ToothmanFord.com. For more West Virginia Mountaineer football content, be sure to follow us on Twitter at In the Gun Podcast. All right, all right, everybody. We got the man you are waiting for, and that is Phil Steele. Again, you can go and check out his preview at Barnes and Noble or Books a Million. Phil, thanks for joining us once again. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Hey, a real pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me on. We're going to jump right into some top 25 action starting tonight. Friday night action out in Corvallis. How do you see Utah at Oregon State, Phil? Well, you know, the, the key for me with Utah is pretty much where they're playing. They're unbeatable in Rice Eccles. We saw that last week. Uh, we saw that against Florida in the opener. And they're a team that just wins and even covers at home. But uh, put them on the road. They're a different animal. They're about a 500 team on the road the last few years. And Oregon State has been an amazing team at home. Uh, 14 and 1 straight up, 14 and 1 against the spread, their last 15 home games. Uh, they've got DJ Uyungalele, who's only got a 7 3 ratio on the year, but Damian Martinez at running back. They've got a strong rush defense, only allowing 70 yards per game. So you've got two really good rundies. You've got two teams that like to run the football. You got two mm, it's sort of average quarterbacks, slight edge to uh, Oregon State. And even if Cam Rising was to play, uh, one of Cam Rising's biggest uh, uh, possibilities or biggest things is uh, his mobility. And I don't think they'd run him all that much. So I like Oregon State to win this one at home. You got a very good home team against an average road team. I like the Beavers in this one at home. Into the SEC, a top 20 matchup, LSU and Ole Miss. Phil, and Phil, this one, I mean, it's a big game for both teams, but it feels a little bit bigger, at least to me, for the Rebels. This is They're in the midst of a, four, a tough four-game stretch. They fell last week to Alabama. I mean, do, do you kind of feel the same way, or, or do you feel like they're, this is a, a still a good opportunity for this team to, to kind of ascend here? Yeah, well, I think Ole Miss, if they do win this game, their whole outlook on the season changes. Uh, then all of a sudden they, they think, uh, you know, uh, this is a team that, I mean, Alabama's got some tough games coming up. they got to play A&M on the road next week so they could lose there. There's a the possibility Alabama could lose twice. So I think they'd feel they're still in it. Uh, lose this game, they're definitely out of it, of course. Uh, with LSU, if they're going to make the uh, playoff this year, which was their preseason aspiration, they got to win this game. Now, with Ole Miss, you go back to their Tulane and Georgia Tech games. They were a 17-point win and a 25-point win. They looked pretty easy, right? Well, in the fourth quarter, those were close games. They just got some late scores. And then last week, they led Alabama, but then got outplayed in the second half. Jackson Dart might be losing his grip on the uh, starting job. Uh, he's only hitting 63% on the year. I think expectations were higher for Jackson Dart. I think this could be a heck of a game. Come right down to the wire, uh, probably a three-point game one way or the other. A slight lean to LSU in this one, but uh, I think it's going to be one of the better games of the evening. Let's head down to Duke. Mike Elko and the 4-0, 17th-ranked Duke Blue Devils. Phil, I saw a list. They're they're one of a very select handful of teams that have won every game by a couple touchdowns or more. They've actually won all four of their games by 21 or more. And they're going to be facing a Notre Dame team looking for a bounce back after that loss to Ohio State. I guess the first question is, is Notre Dame going to roll out with 11 on the field or 10? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, you know, with Notre Dame, though, I, I tell you what, I – if you're talking about one play in the game. Uh, maybe they they don't give up that fourth and nine. Maybe they uh, they don't give up that long third and nineteen. Maybe they don't give up the touchdown at the end of the game. I thought Notre Dame was the better team than Ohio State. Uh, they just came up short on the scoreboard. And you wonder if that's going to have a lingering effect this week. That's probably my biggest question mark. But if you look at Duke, they're as you mentioned four and zero and four and zero against the spread naturally as well with all those big wins. Go back and look at that Clemson game. Uh, Clemson had 29 first downs. Duke only had 17. Clemson got inside the 10-yard uh, line three times with zero points coming off of it. So I, I think they were fortunate against Clemson. Now, game day is going to be on hand. Duke's going to be pumped up. But, 
I think Notre Dame's uh, more uh, used to these big games, whereas Duke, game day on hand, a lot of interviews and things like that, I, I think it might take them out of their game a little bit. So even though you feel the situation favors Duke, they're fresh off an easy game. Uh, Notre Dame's off a titanic struggle and a loss at the end. I'm actually going to lean with Notre Dame to come out of here with the win. Let's move into the Big 12 now, and it's Cincinnati, BYU. And how th- this is going to be a tough uh, game, I think, for BYU, tougher than most people expect. They have really struggled to run the ball all season long. Last week against Kansas, just nine rushing yards, going up against a very tough Cincinnati front seven. So how do you see this one playing out, Phil? Does, does Cincinnati get their first Big 12 win, or does BYU? Yeah, I think if you played this game on a, a neutral field, I might slant Cincinnati a little bit. But uh, I actually like BYU at home in this one. They're, they're playing in Provo. you got the altitude advantage. Uh, it's a long trip for Cincinnati and an unusual trip for Cincinnati as well. Uh, BYU's back at home. And, and Keaton Slovis is looking better than he did last year at Pitt. He's got an 8-3 ratio. Uh, BYU's defense playing pretty well. You go back to the first half against Kansas last week, they only allowed Kansas 139 yards in the first half of that game. So I thought they played good defense. One of Kansas's touchdowns came on a fumble return for a TD. So it's a BYU defense that's playing well. They're at home. Uh, Cincinnati's coming off a tough game against Oklahoma. Uh, the game is basically a, a pick em game almost. Uh, I think uh, BYU is just like a two-point favorite in the game. So I'm going to go with the home team to come out of here with the win. I like the Cougars in this one. And speaking of Kansas, Phil, let's jump down to uh, DKR in Austin, where you have a battle of top 25 teams, Kansas at Texas. And what's interesting about this, a couple of years ago, this was kind of the Kansas coming out party under Lance Leipold. They snapped that eight-game losing streak. It's really when Jalen Daniels introduced himself to the world with his first big game, that big 57-56 overtime shocker. So now they return to the scene of the crime. How do you think things will play out with this unbeaten Kansas team against the unbeaten Longhorns? Yeah, and that was the game that turned it around for Kansas. Uh, clearly uh, gave them a lot of uh, hope, and uh, all of a sudden they started believing in themselves, played better down the stretch, and had a great year last year. Uh, Love the way Kansas is playing. That Illinois game was great. And BYU, they did get a late uh, field goal to get the cover last week, but and we're actually outgained by a little a few yards in the game, but this is a, a dangerous Kansas team. However, Texas will take them seriously. Yes, they have Oklahoma on deck. And when you look at this Texas team, guys, if you look at my magazine uh, and look at my Big 12 ratings for each of the positions, Texas ranks number one in every single position, whether tied for number one or number one. But they're across the board. And and really, where do you find the weakness? Their running backs look great. Quarterback looks great. Receivers, offensive line, defensive line, linebackers, DBs. They look like a complete team this year. They're at home. And last year when they lined up against Kansas uh, looking for revenge, uh, they led that thing 31 nothing at the half and won it 55-14. I do think they're the better team at home. Not going to take Kansas lightly. I'm sure Sarkeesian can uh, tell the team, hey, last time Kansas was here, they beat you guys. So I, I think even with Oklahoma on deck, Texas plays its uh, A game here. And I like the Longhorns to get the win here. Houston at Texas Tech. And this is a game that's the Red Raiders are favored by more than a touchdown, I believe, depending on where you're looking. But – Texas Tech is going to be ushering in a new starting quarterback this week in Baron Morton. Obviously, the the nasty, nasty injury to Tyler Shuck last week. That kid can't stay away from bad injuries. Uh, thoughts out to him. But how do you like Houston's chances in this game with a new quarterback on the other side? Uh, you know, I'm just go back to last year for Texas Tech, and they're playing pretty much true to form. They're outstanding at home. Uh, Look at the the home game they had against Oregon. I mean, you look at Oregon, they're one of the top teams in the country, and uh, Oregon was very fortunate that late uh, return touchdown uh, got them a 38-30 win, and it was a game Texas Tech led in the fourth quarter. And when I say true to form, let's go back to last year. Uh, Last year, Tyler Shuck got injured early, so they had to go to Donovan Smith. They had to go to Baron Morton. They used three different quarterbacks last year, but it didn't matter who was on the field. They pretty much had the same offense, and Baron Morton got him excuse me, got himself three starts last year, uh, put up some big points against West Virginia, as he recalls a starter, and against Oklahoma State. He'll now have all the reps with the first string, so I think we're going to see Baron Morton played like he did last year when he was a starter. I don't think there's going to be any drop-off there. I do feel Texas Tech is the better team. They're at home where they're uh, a much better squad. And when you look at Houston, Houston the first three games was being outgained by like 100-plus yards per game. 
Last week they had a really good game against Sam Houston, but outplayed by UTSA, Rice, and TCU. I think they get outplayed here. I like Texas Tech to win this one by double digits. Let's talk about Baylor at UCF. You got uh, what needs to be a get right game for Dave Aranda. That, that, that crew really took it uh, on the chin in their Big 12 opener at Texas last week, and they're going down to the bounce house uh, to face Gus Malzahn's crew, who's also looking for uh, a get right game. How do you see things uh, unfolding here? Yeah, I, I do think uh, the way UCF's playing, even though John Rice Plumley uh, has been out, uh, Timmy McLean's done a good job in his place. I thought they gave K-State a, a pretty good game last week. It was uh, close at the half, and then uh, K-State pulled away in the second half. But the bounce house is a tough place to play. UCF, this is their first Big 12 home game, so you know they're going to be excited for this one. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little surprised Dave Aranda's bunch is one and three. That Texas State game really surprised me. But they played tough against Utah, and they got blown out last week. Still waiting for them to uh, to, to play to the level that uh, I thought they could this year. And not having Blake Shapin has been a problem. Shapin possibly could return this week. That would help out Baylor. Uh, I like UCF to win the game. Uh, I think the point spread's a little heavy at 12 and a half. Probably stay away from that one uh, spread-wise. But uh, I'm going to go with UCF to win the game at home. How about Iowa State at Oklahoma, 7 o'clock on FS1? And this, again, another team that's really struggled to run the ball. And it's it's kind of foreign for an Iowa State team to not have a really good rusher there in the backfield. It seems like they've had one for years. But they have really struggled to run the ball. With that being said, do they stand any chance against these Sooners? Because, I mean, even though last week they only scored 20 points, it feels like this team can explode for 50 on any given weekend. They could, but Iowa State's got a really good defense. Now, last week they did give up 27 points to an Oklahoma State offense that's been struggling, but prior to that, they've been allowing about 240 yards per game. And the one thing about uh, uh, Matt Campbell, uh, it does great as a double-digit underdog. I think he's unbeaten in Big 12 play as a double-digit wow. dog. In other words, not it's not straight up, but yeah. against the spread. So he'll have his team playing this one tight. Uh, Oklahoma only beat Cincinnati by 14 last week. They only beat us. The game they beat against uh, SMU, that was actually a seven-point game in the fourth quarter. And then they got a couple of late scores to win by 17. So they're not exactly blowing teams out. They've got Texas on deck. I like Oklahoma to win the game, but I'll take Iowa State to cover this one, getting the 20 and a half here. All right, Phil, what everybody wants to hear about the most, let's talk about West Virginia at TCU. You've got a, a Horn Frogs team and Sonny Dykes that was supposed to be led by its defense. But what we've seen, surprisingly, you had in the offseason, Garrett Riley left as the coordinator, went to Clemson. Kendall Bryles steps in, installs a new system in the offseason. They had this mass exodus of talent. Uh, they were hit hard with what they lost on the offensive side, yet still that offense looks, looked pretty explosive. West Virginia, meanwhile, seems to be built with a run game and a strong defense, two things that travel well. How do you see this playing out at Amon G. Carter Stadium? Yeah, and, you know, when I talked to Coach Brown and after the spring practice was over, he talked to me about the offensive line. He talked to me about the running backs, felt really good about it, and, and I like that for West Virginia this year. And really, that's the type of matchup you want to have against TCU. I think TCU uh, wants to be involved in shootout type of games because they're explosive, fast-paced. They want to get it going. West Virginia is the perfect antidote for that. Slow the game down, run the football, take them out of their – uh, the scheme a little bit. So I, I think West Virginia will give TCU a game here. But uh, I tell you what, the situation really sets up well for TCU. You're looking at West Virginia off two huge home wins, now having to travel all the way to, to uh, Texas. Meanwhile, uh, TCU surprised me last week. Uh, the game was close at the half against uh, SMU. In fact, they were actually getting out gained, 213 to 155 at the half, but led 14-10. Then in the second half, they sort of uh, turned the screws in and, and beat SMU by uh, 17 points. So it's a TCU team that uh, I think is coming into form. Chandler Morris is a quarterback who, remember last year, he beat out Max Duggan for the starting job. Uh, Amani Bailey's rushing for over, rushing for six yards a carry, and they've got some dangerous receivers. So a very good TCU team at home. I think it's going to be tough to win the game outright. However, I think West Virginia keeps this one tight. I've got TCU winning by like seven points in this one. With the spread up there at 12 and a half, I like West Virginia. And who knows, maybe if they can uh, win that turnover margin, they'd have a shot at it. Uh, I, I think West Virginia is going to give TCU a good game here. Last thing before we let you go, Phil, I've got to ask you, at three and one, West Virginia is halfway to bowl eligibility, okay? And, and there's a lot of publications out there 
that are starting to kind of put the Mountaineers in these bowl projections. Some of them are not. Where are you kind of right now on West Virginia in their postseason hopes? Do you feel like this is a team that's kind of done enough to prove that they're going to be able to get to bowl eligibility, or do you feel like there's still a lot of work to do? Yeah, I do think they're going to get to a bowl game this year. And I, I tell you what, uh, guys, uh, now last year uh, I was sort of high on Auburn coming into the year. And then they had a coach that was on the hot seat, and they lost a couple of crucial games early. And then the team just, you know, it was a, a dead man walking for uh, Coach Harson last year. And the team didn't have the leadership. And then Auburn ended up with a losing season. And that was my concern with West Virginia. I thought if they open up this year, maybe one and three, because you knew they were going to be a dog in the, probably in the first three, three of the – four first games that they could be under a lot of pressure, but being at three and one now, they're not going to get to that situation. And Neil Brown was confident in this team. When I talked to him uh, post spring, I think Neil Brown's going to get this team to a bowl. I like them against Oklahoma state at home. I like them against BYU at home. I like them against Cincinnati at home. They can pick up a road win as well. So just getting to bowl eligibility may not even be the ceiling on this year's West Virginia. They could probably even get to seven wins. Very impressed. Uh, any team that's got the run game and the defense they have, I think has a threat in any single game they play. So I'm bullish on the fact West Virginia should make a bowl game this year. Awesome, Phil. Thank you uh, again so much for joining us this week. And and as you said, maybe maybe you can take an, a week off in terms of getting your pr prediction right for the West Virginia game. You're four for four so <laughs> far. Maybe you get your first one wrong this week. But we appreciate you for joining us, and we'll talk again next week. Hey, sounds great, guys. And uh, looking forward to another fun weekend of football this week. Appreciate that, Phil. Absolutely. So that's Phil Steele. Again, you can get his preview uh, magazine, which is still very, very helpful uh, during this college football season at Barnes & Noble and Books A Million. So we're going to take a qu another quick break. When we return, Jed and I will make our handicaps for West Virginia and TCU. For nearly 20 years, Fortis has been the nation's leader in providing guaranteed roof performance programs for commercial buildings. Fortis offers roof performance solutions that feature extensive initial and ongoing reconditioning for commercial buildings as an alternative to traditional replacement with long-term performance guarantees that are backed by global leader Lloyd's of London. Fortis offers a comprehensive range of roof performance management programs that provide financial security, extend the life of our customers' roofs, and make a significant impact on ROI. Fortis is currently improving performance and increasing ROI for customers at more than 4,800 locations with more than 140 million square feet protected, including many Fortune 500 companies that have turned to Fortis to save money, gain financial certainty, and extend the life of their existing roofs. Fortis has helped customers save more than $520 million in capital roof replacement costs for an average ROI of over 250%. To learn more, visit fortis.us.com. Fortis, roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. All right, Judd, so it's another week of handicaps here. West Virginia TCU, I had a rough week last week. And uh, the, to those of you that probably watch this every Friday, it's probably no shock, but uh, we'll see if I can get back on the horse this week and get in the right, uh, in the win column. So what do you got cooking for us this week, Judd? I got three of them. Uh, and before we jump into that, I wanted to double back and say, I, I love it when Phil calls SMU smooth. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I love that. I love that. But uh, so let's start with this. In each of the last two games against TCU, last year in Morgantown and two years ago in Fort Worth, West Virginia did a good job of holding the football. Mm -hmm. Last year, we had the ball for 36 minutes. And that's one of the reasons it was a one possession game into the final minutes. Two years ago in, in uh, at TCU in the win at Amon G. Carter, we had the ball for 35 minutes. Wow. Now, so far this year, West Virginia is averaging just under 33 minutes per game in time of possession. So what I'm going to do, uh, and understanding that TCU is not really a team that focuses much on time of possession, they use some tempo. Uh, I'm going to peg the over-under. I'm going to handicap it at, what are you taking? West Virginia, time of possession, over-under, 33 and a half minutes. Hmm. My my initial gut is just telling me to take the over because I think West Virginia, they know they have to kind of play clock control a little bit in this one. Yes. So I, I think you have to go with the over here. Run the football, shrink the game. It seems like the same game plan week and week and week and week and week. But 
I, I think they know that's how they got to win this game. You know, they're, they're two score underdogs going into this one. So I'm going to say the over in this one. Uh, I'm going to agree with you. Uh, I think that's the style of game that we necessarily have to play. Uh, so I think we're going to be committed to that. Uh, 33 and a half is pretty chunky, but I think we can find a way to, again, the last time we were, we were down there, it was 35. So not and, impossible. And that was, that was without much run game from the quarterback position. Of course, Garrett had a big run two years ago down there that people remember, but, but by and large with Jarrett taking all the snaps, that wasn't a big part of what we were doing now with either quarterback this year. That's, that's a big part of what we're doing. So I'm going to take the over 33 and a half minutes. Now, Let's talk rushing. DCU has outrushed all four of its, its opponents, of course, aided in large measure by Amani Bailey, who's the top rusher in the Big 12. Uh, when you look at the standings, TCU is fourth in the Big 12 at 208 a game in rushing offense. West Virginia is sixth at 190 a game. So the question is quite simple. Will WVU outrush TCU? Yes, I think they do. And that's and, and it's going to be close because I, I do think Bailey and even Chandler Morris can run it a little bit too. They've got some depth of running back. I think it'll be close, but TCU is going to be able to, to, to sling the ball around the yard a little bit against the secondary. I know the secondary's played well the last few weeks for West Virginia, but let's face it, Phil Dracovic, I mean, that's that's a quarterback that's been struggling all season long. You got Texas Tech in there with a backup quarterback for three fourths of the game. This is going to be their first true test against a passing quarterback, really, since Drew Aller in Penn State. So I think they're going to be able to throw the ball a little bit. West Virginia, on the other hand, they know they're going to have to run the ball to have a chance. So I'm going to go with West Virginia gets the edge in the rushing category. Well, you know, this is boring uh, because we're both. <laughs> in the game. So let's let's first first and foremost talk about. Matter of fact, just to make it interesting, I'm going to say no. Uh, and, and I'll give you a reason why. Uh, TCU ranks last in the Big 12 against the pass. Now, that's top-heavy in the sense that they gave up 500 yards passing to Colorado. So they've settled in since then. But there are some opportunities for some shot plays on the back end when you study them on tape. Uh, I think West Virginia is seeing what I see when you study them on tape. I think we're going to try and take some of those shots. And unlike the last four games, I think we're going to hit some of those shots. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say that, yeah, we need to run the ball effectively, but I think by virtue of having a, a handful of big shot plays through the air, um, we might lean just as much on that this week. And we won't run for quite what, that's right. We won't, we won't, we won't run for quite what TCU uh, does. So I'm going to and, say no. And TCU's also got one of the better rushing defenses in the country. I think they're 16th nationally. So, so eighty five yards a carry, eighty five yards yeah. a game. Their yards per carry is among the national leaders, easily the best in the Big Twelve. They're tough to run on. Uh, so now, finally, number three. Last year's game in Morgantown to me was kind of the poster child for our defensive struggles against big plays. They had five plays of thirty plus yards, but more specifically in that game last year in Morgantown, they had four plays of fifty plus yards. Yes. Now the That's Mountaineers knock on wood. The Mountaineers knock on wood have allowed just one play of fifty plus yards through four games, and that was, of course, the early touchdown pass we allowed to Penn State. So we we've, we've done a good job through four games of putting a lid on things. Have we done a good enough job to prevent TCU from having one play of fifty plus yards? Will wow. TCU have a play of 50 plus yards. I was really hoping I was really hoping that would be a one and a half or right there because I would have took the under. Uh, oh man. Well really it's half. You know, yeah. Half. Is it I'm, is it over or under half of uh, one fifty yard play? Yeah. Uh, I, I I feel like they're gonna get one. Uh but maybe I'll just try and speak it into existence here and say no. I don't think they do. I think they they kind of slice and dice West Virginia's defense up in a different way. They Not so much methodically, but they go with a lot of underneath game. West Virginia's kind of – I think that's one of the the one of the most overlooked points as far as – they've actually tackled pretty well this season. And a lot of that credit goes back to what they did in fall camp. Neil talking about how they wanted to be more physical, tackle more than they ever tackled. I think they're going to be ready for this and not give up those explosive plays and with the communication – 
being much better than it was a year ago. The understanding of zone coverage is light years better than what it was a year ago. I think they are able to keep a lid on that that top big explosive play of 50-plus yards. So I don't think they do get there. Uh, well, bear in mind, uh, it's not just different personnel. Their top receivers are gone. Their starting quarterback from a year ago, their yeah. Heisman finalist is gone. But it's a completely different construct offensively, a different scheme. They they brought a new totally. coordinator in in the offseason and Kendall Bryles and installed a new offense in the spring. So everything's different. Uh, now, that being said, I do think that TCU is due. They're getting a couple wideouts back this week that have been on the shelf for a few weeks. Uh, I do think that they they recognize the need for some big plays to the pass game. And uh, I think that they're going to kind of sell out to try and make that happen. So I do think they'll find a way to get at least one. And uh, Chandler Morse is a pretty good player. Uh, they yes. haven't been pop popping a lot of them deep this year, but he's an accurate kid. Uh, I think they present enough challenges, keep you honest in the run game enough that it's asking a lot to – to put a complete lid on things in the past game when you're dialed in on stopping Amani Bailey. So I think they find a way to get to one play of 50 plus yards. Well, we all know how this week's going to go. I, it's like me, I'm you in these uh, for the big 12 pickums. I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm taking over your, your struggles here in these, these handicaps. So maybe it makes me feel good when we had yeah. 30 some people <laughs> for last week and, and one guy got what I'm trying to get right. <laughs> you had none. Exactly. <laughs> So at least it made me do feel make me feel a little bit better. And if you do want to take uh, if you do want to participate on that, I believe it's on our, our Twitter account. So uh, go in and sign up and see if you can try and beat Wes, Jed, and myself and Owen uh, picking the best offense, defense, uh, best passing offense and best rushing offense in the Big 12 every week. And if you do get all four correct, I think we're going to send you an autographed Owen Schmidt picture i believe is what we're we're kind of at least agreeing it's on. Be yeah like at least it's hard but if, if you if you get four right that's that's high cotton i mean that's yeah. gonna be tough. i mean we uh, struggle we'll, to get we'll one worth, right <laughs> we'll make it worth your while uh it's gonna be fun like i said 30 some people participated last week one got the uh top passing offense right none got the top scoring offense right it's when you're trying to string together all four it's hard enough for us to get one right it is. When you're trying to string together all four, that, that's really impressive. It takes knowledge and luck to do that, I think. And we had a couple people that participated last week. They got two of the four right. So keep on chugging. Somebody is going to get all four of those those bad boys, and we're going to make it worth your while, and, and you'll have some fun when when, uh, when you do that. Yeah, Albert, Morsi, and Jim. Whoever Jim is, congratulations, yeah. Yeah. by McMahon, the way, for this week. BYU's top passing <laughs> And, and to and to be honest, like I thought it would be a lot easier uh, than than what it has been. When you told me kind of what the deal was with this, I was like, all right, I, can, I feel like I can do this every week. And I think I've got two, maybe three, and no, I don't think I've finished with the top one yet. So that just shows you how hard it is. So, anyways, uh, one final thank you to Fortis for roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. Be sure to visit Fortis.us. Com. And also, if you haven't checked it out yet, the West Virginia TCU preview is up. Jed, Owen, and Wes go in full depth detail about that. You also hear the behind the scenes story of Wes's <laughs> trip back from Las Vegas. And uh, you also get uh, Owen's homecoming uh, story as well about a little pony and, and stuff like that. So it, it, there's a lot of he good stuff in that ball. preview. He is. He's a big teddy bear. Big so. Teddy. Yeah. Anyways, that'll do it for us here today. We'll be back next week uh, kicking off the bye week with Big Daddy recapping the first five games of the season. So uh, be sure to follow us on Twitter at In The Gun Podcast. Hit that subscribe button. Give us a like. Drop some comments in that YouTube channel below as well. And the one thing we ask of you is to be an ear and tell an ear about your new favorite WB football podcast. You've been In The Gun.